It's my great pleasure to welcome Mohan Birsani to introduce him as a professor of management with the prestigious Kellogg School of Management would be a total understatement. Let me put it this way, he has been rated as amongst the top 25 intellectuals, top 50 greatest minds in the US by Forbes and Business Week together. Professor Sani, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. You know, uh, when we meet at these conferences, uh, where it's PAN-IT, other uh, entrepreneurial conferences, we always think of individuals like you who bring research, innovation, and help a productize or get commercialized. We have done it so well in this country, but not so good in India. It's still emerging. Where do you see the challenges, if you may point out one or two, in Indian schools, and how we can bridge that gap? Well, I think you have to look at the education, but you also have to look at the uh, institutional infrastructure for innovation. So at the school level, I think one of the couple of challenges that as growing up in, in India and being educated there, I realized uh, we take a very narrow, linear, and rote-oriented approach to learning. And uh, the emphasis on discovery and on play is not as much as on road learning. And that is the, the, the old model of education, which is starting. And, and uh, what I notice here, the schools are very, very different. Uh, they encourage a lot more creativity in thinking. Um, we also had a very narrow set of career options for us because it was difficult to find jobs and because there were so many people competing for the jobs. So you could be a doctor or you could be an engineer, and that was pretty much it. Uh, but there's a lot more freedom to explore your innate potential in this country. So those are some of the things we can learn from uh, this environment. Uh, beyond that, as entrepreneurs, it has been difficult to uh, find the institutions of entrepreneurship that are so taken for granted in Silicon Valley, uh, whether it's financing or professional services or physical infrastructure. So those have been lacking. but. But all of this is changing. I think India is getting now much more in touch with and connected with the rest of the world. So you'll see the education system evolve. A whole new breed of new schools, new educational institutions are coming up. And the, inst the infrastructure for investment is also being built. So I have great hope that uh, going forward, uh, the Indian innovations for the Indian context uh, will flourish. Let me ask you this. A lot of students who don't go to Ivy League schools where you teach, but have great potential to become entrepreneurs. And they look at Stanford's and Harvard's and Kellogg and they say, well, you know, I wish I could be there. How much does it matter to go to a school like yours, you know, and go to an average school and become a successful entrepreneur? Well, I think, um, first of all, entrepreneurship is not necessarily something that we can teach. Uh, it is, aspects of it are innate. So if you are an entrepreneur, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you have to go to the best college and conversely if you came out of the best college doesn't mean you're going to be uh, a good entrepreneur although the one benefit you do have going to and perhaps the biggest benefit you do have going to an institution such as ours is the network the, the people that you get to know and somebody once told me that my network is more valuable than my net worth um, because it's the people you know it's the people you get connected with. because ultimately if you want to be an entrepreneur you need a team you need people who can help you can mentor you can work with you and if you're surrounded by people who are smart and people who are well connected and people who you can look up to, um, that, that is a tremendous advantage. So what I would advise any entrepreneur to do, they don't have the benefit of this, is to build your own network. Uh, to spend a lot of time figuring out who to, how, how to get connected to and who to get connected to, because that really is going to uh, help you tremendously as you seek to build your own companies. As a professor, if I take you back 15 years and your teaching methodologies, and to the current scenario and where the future is leading because technology is changing so rapidly. What has changed in terms of teaching methodology and how have we evolved as a profession? I think perhaps the biggest change in teaching is that um, in the absence of, in a, in a world of information scarcity, uh, teachers become arbiters of information. They are doling out pieces of knowledge and information because they have control over the knowledge and information, uh, whether that's in books or in journals and so on. I think the democratization of information and the instant availability of knowledge at fingertips is perhaps the biggest change that I have seen. And, and it's, it's, it not only threatens us in our traditional role, but it demands of us new roles. 
So now I see myself as a curator, as, as, as someone who helps my students in their discovery, because they have the resources at their disposal. It's just how to guide them, how to help them navigate through this information. So my role has, uh, has changed and evolved. I also find that uh, the technology is now part of the lifeblood of teaching, whether it's the uh, instructional technology that we use or it's even the pedagogical techniques. Uh, for instance, I am uh, currently building a s strategy simulation game that will be web-based and, uh, well, and it, it, it's, it's actually going to be hosted in the cloud. Um, and, and funnily, it's going to be called Cloud Sim. But that's an example of the kinds of things we couldn't do before. Another example of what I'm doing is a program for Microsoft called uh, Virtual Catalog on Marketing, where we are taking advantage of live meeting, um, and uh, distributed technologies to create a learning program that can be scaled to 7,000 of their people worldwide at one-tenth the cost and 80% of the fidelity. So I think that the use of these technologies, which is really a hybrid, a combination between face-to-face -face and uh, uh, distance learning, has the potential to transform uh, the cost-effectiveness of education, which remains the biggest challenge in uh, the United States. The cost of education is extremely high. I think technology has the potential to greatly increase our leverage uh, without losing some of the richness and effectiveness. Finally, uh, it comes to being mentoring and uh, you know, inspiring. Uh, there's great many leaders uh, have come out of IITs, uh, and people like you are great examples of that. Where do you personally see your legacy? Not just as a professor, but as a role model to so many of your students and entrepreneurs. I'm not dead yet, so I, I don't know what my legacy will be or uh, what I want it to be. It's, it's a very big question to ask and it's a very noble goal to aspire towards. I think what one tries to do is uh, just on a uh, make small contributions and these small contributions are, and I, and I tell my colleagues who are in sim similar positions of responsibility that if someone reaches out to you, someone calls you, someone contacts you, give them half an hour as a gift. Uh, just now you can't do that all the time uh, but what you want to do is uh, never forget where you came from and never forget that at one time you were the one reaching out so it is your response and and much of the success that you owe is to people that have given you the time that have been mentors for you so it is uh, it's a circle of life you have to give back and and I try to remind myself that uh, we should always be humble and we should always uh, be there for uh, the people who, just in ways that our seniors and, and our mentors were there. So that's a, that, I think that's the circle of giving um, that ultimately builds the legacy. All right, Professor Sani, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you.